So hello everyone, um, welcome to all of our second um, and final parallel sessions of the today. And this is about uh, another one of our new thematic areas we want to look at as a network, and this is resilience. And I, and I think um, new manufacturing resilience has always been really important, but I think the events over the last few months have, um, <laughs> have made us realize how even more important it is at this time. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna have a short video and that's from John Erka Junko, from, who's a, a senior lecturer in digital service engineering at Cranfield. He's going to introduce this topic. Then after that, we're going to break out into groups again. And, I'll, and once we've watched the video, I'll give you some um, instructions about that. So if you can play the video now, please, Sonny. Welcome to this presentation on resilience to enable value creation in through life engineering services. I'm John Arkoinju and I am the director of the Through Life Engineering Services Centre at Cranfield University. As part of this presentation, I would like to start by defining resilience and defining different scenarios for resilience. From there, I will go into a case study within the aerospace sector to look at how we can implement Through Life Engineering. And finally, I will move on to providing some conclusions for this presentation so that we can lead into some discussions as part of this session. One of the first definitions of resilience by Holling in 1973 referred to resilience as an ecosystem which can absorb changes and still exist. So it highlighted that resilience is an ability to respond to changes. Over the past years, we've observed that the definition of resilience has moved from maintaining or regaining a dynamically stable state to the ability to sustain required operations. This shift is quite significant in that we are now focusing on achieving outcomes as an outcome of the resilience. A more recent definition by Eric Holnagel highlights that a system is resilient if it can adjust its functioning prior to, during or following events and thereby sustain required operations under both expected and unexpected conditions. So what we can see from this is that resilience is a process and it is covering the life cycle of different kind of products or processes whereby we're trying to meet outcomes. To go into a bit more detail in order to understand resilience, this figure highlights that in any given system, we have a reliability phase where a disruptive event creates unreliability and this reduces the productive space. This then leads to a disruptive time period, which may have some level of stability in that process. And this will lead to a recovery phase. So the recovery phase then may lead to the recovered steady state where the productivity may reach the state before the disruptive event had taken place. So what's interesting here is that we have a gap from the disruptive event until the recovered steady state takes place. And resilience has a role in managing that time gap between the disruptive event and the recovered steady state. So to go into a bit more detail in that 
time between the disruptive event and the steady state where we've recovered to the system performance that we'd like. There's different ways to look at this, whether we want to understand degradation, as you can see here, or we can, we can see the collapse in the system performance. So resilience is really about understanding what is the state of performance that we would like and really trying to match the activities to respond to that disruptive event. So we need to look at these different scenarios and map the efforts that's required to be able to sustain the system performance that we'd like to achieve. So this slide goes into a bit more detail in terms of when we reach a crisis point or a disruption and the damage affects the level of functionality that we have in a system, there are different ways to respond to this. And this figure highlights that we have a resilience triangle. And the resilience triangle is trying to highlight that we may have an approach for high resilience or low resilience as highlighted in the red and green lines in this figure. So if this is a critical system, which uh, may have safety implications, we may need to put more effort, more investment in here to have a high resilience type system. If the system at hand doesn't offer highly critical functionality, maybe we prefer to take a low resilience approach. So what this is trying to highlight is that at a system level, we may have different levels of resilience that we'd like to implement. And as an outcome, we need to understand how the functionality is affected at the total system level. So this is where resilience engineering really has a role to play in terms of optimizing the functionality that we're trying to achieve. Now I would like to move into an example from the aerospace sector. This is a project that is ATI funded and it's titled Digitally Optimized Through Life Engineering Services. As part of this, we have numerous targets such as meeting optimized design, having a benignly operated system, achieving perfectly timed maintenance, precisely meeting the targeted work scopes, having the perfect maintenance execution, and also having the perfect asset valuation. Now, in this slide, you can see definitions for each of these areas, but ultimately, resilience has a key role to be able to meet the targets in each of these areas. So if I am to give you an example, if we focus specifically on perfectly timed maintenance, we want to achieve superbly timed occurrences so that we can minimize the cost, balance the operational impact, and manage the risk and cost for the functional restoration that we're going to achieve. And again, the resilience is critical in this process so that we can achieve all these different targets. Now, for maintenance, one of the biggest challenges that we face is with degradation. So if you can see from this figure where damage is increasing over the life cycle, whereby we may start with an initiation, and this initiation of the damage continues until a, dam a failure occurs. So we need to now time the scheduled maintenance appropriately. 
we also need to define what will be the appropriate level of repair and what will be the suitable replacements in this process. So we need to know to be able to make a positive change, all the damage initiations, the progression of the damage, the intervention that we can make, and the recovery. So resilience plays a critical role in this process in terms of understanding how degradation plays a role and how we can start to go into more detail. So what we're doing as part of this project is really looking at building a deterioration knowledge base. So that will involve creating a library of knowledge around the fundamentals of how we generate value when we're de dealing with product degradation. So the knowledge base that we're building that will facilitate better resilience management is trying to answer a number of questions, such as how does my component degrade? What are the degradation drivers and consequences? How will we know when a component has insufficient remaining use for life? And how could or should I treat degradation? And what are the through life costs and resources to keep my component working? All these questions will actually help to define the component, help to understand the life cycle better, and it will enable to optimize various types of factors like cost, like performance, like the timing of the mitigation actions, and also defining the priority areas that we'd like to focus on. So given that we only will have a limited budget, uh, affordability will be a key factor as well as the profitability. Uh, coming up with a suitable resilience strategy plays a critical role to meet the numerous targets that organizations have. Now in a through life context, looking at things like maintenance or service and support. Companies like Rolls-Royce, BA Systems, Babcock International derive value through the activities of avoid, contain, recover. So avoid refers to the ability to avoid degradation, look at how we can capture avoid behaviors from design to manufacture to in service. Contain refers to our ability to contain the impact. So if we can understand the current health, we can start to respond to any deviations which may impact. And the other area is around recover. And recover refers to our ability to recover the health once a problem has occurred. So this is the point where we respond to a problem and we try to respond in a timely manner as needed. And the next area is around convert. So convert is referring to the experience to incrementally add value. In a way, you can consider this as the intelligence in the system that fuels the decision making. So our resilience related activities need to link in to all these value generating activities in through life engineering services, because this is where we can make the most impact. To go into a bit more detail with how value is generated in through life engineering services, this slide explains the sub-processes of avoid, contain, and recover. So in avoid, we're looking at design, manufacture, and usage as the main areas that you can derive value. So just to give one example, in terms of design, the product 
can be optimized to, for through life value. This could be about maintenance free life, could be about failure modes, could be about our, our ability to monitor or repair. And all these aspects have a direct connection to how we can actually implement resilience. In terms of contain, we're looking at things like the timing and the scope of activities that are required to contain the impact. So in terms of timing, we're looking at how to optimize the timing of the different support activities, whether it's things like inspection, maintenance, or retirement. So if we can optimize this timing, there's clearly an impact in terms of resilience, whereby we can start to respond to impactful uh, activities and we can time this a lot better. In terms of recover, this is about when something has failed and we're responding to that. This is really about all these different aspects and I'll focus on one example here in terms of move. So we would like to minimize the transportation of products, systems, components and resources. And this is really just to highlight that resilience is also critical in terms of transportation so that we are responding in a timely manner and delivering the parts as and when they're needed. So as part of this presentation, I've tried to give you a bit of an introduction to resilience. I've tried to highlight when and where resilience can have a role. And what's come out quite clearly is that resilience can enable consistency when we're trying to achieve productivity and sustainability. We need to take a life cycle perspective, particularly when we're dealing with complex disruptions, which are dynamic over time. And we need to come up with suitable plans whereby resilience can be implemented. And we can link this into the value generating activities, as I showed in the example of through life engineering services in aerospace. We also need to really think about what is possible in terms of the processes and technologies that are available to add value. So with that, I hope this gives you a good introduction to resilience, and I hope you will have some fruitful discussions as part of this session. So thank you very much for your attention and we'll welcome questions as part of this uh, session. Thank you. Well, thank you, John, for that, um, that good introduction and overview of resilience. So what we're going to do now is, is go back to our tables. Um, and I think we've got 11 attendees. So it'd be good to have a table of six and a table of five. And we're going, you're just going to discuss through three, three questions. What's the current status of resilience within digital manufacturing? What are the knowledge gaps around resilience research? And, and what are the main research questions? Um, so those of you who, have, who weren't involved in any other sessions, you'll see there's a whiteboard at the bottom. If all of you click on that, and then you go to the text box, which is a team, you can, you can add your comments. But if you can put them the comments around those three questions, that would be great. And then in 30 minutes, what we'll do is we'll come back and we, we've got some people nominated to um, to, to report back from the, from the different tables. And we'll see if John's got any, any final comments he wants to add. So Sally, if you can send people to their tables, that'd be great. So welcome back, everyone. <clears throat> Hope you had some um, some good discussions and heated debate about the the resilience theme. So I think what we're going to do now in the last fifteen minutes is we'll, I'll just invite someone from each of the tables to to report back, and then we'll, we'll get John to just give some closing remarks. So would Chinzia, would you like to um, come on, Sally? If you can just add Chinzia as a presenter. Yeah. Hi, Hello. Chinzia. Hello, I'm Nick. How are you doing? Fine, thanks. 
Luckily, yeah. I say I copy and pasted my notes from the whiteboard in a Word document. Now I've got them in front of me. <laughs> yeah, just, sorry, I should. I was meant to tell you that at the beginning. <laughs> I imagine that the, the whiteboard would disappear. <laughs> Good. Brilliant. Great. Okay, shall we go? Yeah, yeah, please do. Yeah, what did your group have to say? Yeah, so we had a very nice discussion around uh, uh, resilience. Um, so I, we started with, you know, talking about that uh, currently there, is, there are a lot of methods to monitor process and, for instance, or quality of product, but not always there is an emphasis on, you know, understanding why. So we know when things go wrong, but then it's difficult or it takes time to understand why things are happening and try to fix it. So there is some latency between when some erroneous event comes come and then the time when we find a solution when we recover from this of course the digital twin should help with that because that would allow to have a, a digitalized version of a product of a process so which would enable the real time to know when things are going wrong and also understanding how to to fix the problem and you know what to do but uh, we realize also that uh, in real world, uh, not many uh, digital twins implemented uh, in the organization. So there is still some work to be done. We focus then around the response time. So, you know, what is what would be the time between uh, the, the erroneous event and then the recovering? And we realize that this really depends on the system. Uh, so it's linked to the system itself. So some, you know, research and some uh, work around understanding what is the ideal response time for self-healing healing and self-repairing system would be kind of ideal. Okay, so we went to the second uh, second question. Again, you know, this links, so we talked about uh, how can we relate uh, how, how fast the response should be for, uh, for a certain system. So understanding the response time is kind of uh, an area that would need further improvement. Uh, we talked also about that, you know, sometimes the, in order to recover, in order to enable recovery and resilience, we need to make decisions. And uh, decisions are, uh, you know, optimal decisions are hindered by the lack of knowledge or data. So we might need that knowledge from or data from different systems to be able to, to make an optimal decision. And sometimes uh, organizations tend to work in compartments or so making decisions for their own uh, department as opposed to make a more uh, decision that involves all uh, the key players. Uh, so uh, that ideally there would be more needed of more automation that uh, would enable to uh, allow integration of, of systems and different stream of knowledge. Um, yes, another gap uh, is uh, that uh, sometimes, you know, if we think about uh, system degradation or, you know, knowing when failure will be occurring, we don't know what to measure. OK, so not only that we don't have, uh, you know, sense, but we don't know what what we need to measure and uh, how uh, understand the kind of the, the sensor, um, you know, the, the sensor data. Um, OK, so another issue uh, is about uh, uh, understand in terms of understanding degradation is that sometimes it's difficult to distinguish between material degradation and human error. So how do we quantify uh, error from human behavior? So there are uh, there are no, uh, you know, sometimes it's difficult to, to, to do that. Um, so going into that, then we also talk about that there is also lack of uh, appropriate methods to capture human knowledge and experience. So if we want to recover, sometimes, you know, if we think about a machine that breaks, then an experienced operator would know how to fix it, would know what are the signals that tell the operator how to, um, you know, that the, the system is about to fail. So uh, how do we actually embed this knowledge? How do we capture this knowledge that can be reused within uh, the organization? 
And then we talked about, of course, predictive capabilities, so developing predictive tools to be able to actually predict failures before they, they occur. Okay, but then we know that this is very challenging. So this leads to the, the third one. So we think that one of the most challenging things and uh, uh, that we need to solve is that uh, it, the, the, in order to develop predictive system, we need a lot of data. But in fact, there is lack of data because especially failures are rare. So we don't have uh, failure data. So it's really difficult to uh, develop and build these predictive systems. So there would be the need of developing some sort of generalized AI, which you know is able to learn from maybe rules or other systems when there is lack of data. And then another important uh, um, research question is understanding what to measure, how to measure, and detect degradation in systems, because there might be some challenging uh, environment where you know standard sensor don't uh, don't work well. So really, there is the need of de uh, development and research into new sensors. Brilliant. Thanks. It sounds yeah. like you had a very, very long and detailed yeah. discussion. <laughs> I hope I've captured everything and uh, yeah. But it was a no, very, very good discussion and a lot of input. So thanks to everyone that contributed. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, so can we have Oliver on the on the screen next, please? We're just waiting to get hold of Ollie. See if I can do that. Um, so Ollie, Oliver, you should have had an invitation that you need to accept to then come onto the screen. We'll give him a, a couple more back. Um, if anyone else from the group wants to report back if they can just just comment in the, the chat box and we'll be we'll be able to make them a presenter Sally will so it doesn't seem to have appeared um Sally if you could just send that again please just bear with us one second guys Have you received that yet, Ali? Or if we've not got that, I wonder if we can. I believe John was on that table. Um, so perhaps if we could, could get John to come on, he could give a quick summary of what what was discussed, and then um, some maybe concluding remarks for the session. Yeah, John. John's there. Hi. Hi, John. <laughs> Hi, everyone. So yeah, we we had a, a good discussion around uh, the three questions. Um, so we firstly tried to evaluate the kind of um, in a way challenges. Uh, one area which came out was: um, is there any improvement really in digital manufacturing compared to the traditional? Uh, approaches that was uh, used maybe in the past and um, the kind of discussion we had was uh, kind of looking at in the past maybe we looked at single component level decisions whereas now it's moving maybe to more compound uh, decisions so looking at multiple components looking at uh, systems and trying to understand them better um, we also had some discussion around how do you realize uh, disruptions, when do they happen, how do they happen, um, and can we start to characterize them so that you can become more proactive. Um, we had some discussions around um, the skills, uh, and particularly there was some uh, evaluation in terms of different technologies that are available, and when to use which, and how to kind of structure them. We also uh, had some discussion around future research. Uh, one area that we talked a little about was uh, about uncertainty, particularly in terms of how can we 
measure uncertainty uh, so that we can start to become more proactive. Uh, so that was something that we thought could be interesting in the future, as well as optimize resilience, the responses, um, and particularly go into a bit more detail in terms of uh, the different approaches that can be taken uh, and uh, what areas you want to be proactive and what areas you don't need to be proactive. Uh, and that kind of separation could be interesting for resilience. Um, we had a bit of discussion, I think, also about um, the uh, how we can determine res uh, the, the disruptions uh, and, and looked at different kinds of technologies like maybe sensors or digital twins, whether they can actually improve the current uh, processes. Um, so, yeah, there was various discussions um, and, yeah, hope. That's an overview. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, John. Um, so that, that's great. And then just, just want to thank everyone for being involved in these sessions. It's it's um, really important for the network. And what we'll be doing with these is we'll, we'll be saving the whiteboard so we've got those points. And we'll be moving forward looking at some of our new thematic areas, um, which will then inform our, our future feasibility studies. So that, that's it from me. Um, so thanks a lot for attending today. And uh, I'll see you tomorrow at the, at the session then. Cheers. Bye.